Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 106. Uh, we are recording. Uh, it's been a while since we've been on mic, and uh, the election is behind us. It's in our rearview mirrors, although we're still dealing with sort of the repercussions of it. Um, but we'll see how this gets played out. Uh, but uh, yeah, how are you doing, Omar? It's been a while. Uh, hey, Barbara. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, doing good. Um, wow, it's already, it's already almost December 2020. The year is... Almost, we're almost at the at the end. I don't, I don't know what that means, but we're almost at the end. I'm definitely looking forward to, to the holidays. That's for sure. Because uh, like a lot of people, we've been cranking, you know, powering through work, powering through the stress, uh, powering through the election stress, all that sort of stuff. And uh, I'm definitely looking for for the forward to the break, but pow- still powering through with work and a couple other things. Uh, so yeah, doing okay. How about you? Okay. Good, good, good. All is well. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we, we, here we are recording like about a little less than a week, uh, of, uh, you know, uh, from Thanksgiving. Uh, I imagine for like, like us, for most of our listeners, Thanksgiving is going to be kind of an interesting time, very, very unusual. But uh, I think we've gotten used to the unusual, as it were. Um, well, I know it's one of your but, favorite holidays, and we, we usually... Uh, when we're when we're well, when we're all in miss- town, we all get together, but that's not happening. Yeah. So we're gonna miss that. Yeah, sure. yeah, for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll try to make the most of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm uh, in the Thanksgiving spirit, as it were, and uh, the spirit spirit of gratitude. I am very grateful um, uh, that we are able to have our guest on the show today and. Our guest today is Sadia Jalali. Um, Sadia is a licensed marriage and family therapist. Uh, Sadia holds a BA in psychology from the University of Houston, my uh, alma mater, uh, as well as an MA in psychology and family therapy from the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Um, In over 14 years as a counselor, she has worked with hundreds of clients specializing in relationships, parenting, anger management, divorce care, self-care, and being Muslim in America. Um, Active in the uh, Houston Muslim community, and I can certainly speak to that, um, for over 20 years, uh, she she has held workshops and speaking engagements for many local and national Muslim organizations. She founded Muslim Bliss, which is dedicated to bringing issues of mental health and relationships to the forefront in the Muslim community. She is currently pursuing a graduate degree in Islamic Studies, uh, from the Bayan Claremont, um, of course, we've had Jihad Turk on the show in the past, uh, and other uh, um, alumni uh, from that uh, institution. So anyway, Sadia, we are super delighted to have you on the show. Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to uh, talk with you guys. You guys always bring some wonderful um, guests and just the topics that you all cover are so relevant to so many of us. So excited to be here. Thank you. No, and I think you're a first in the sense that I don't think we've ever had a sibling of a former guest on the show. So uh, <laughs> your brother, your oldest brother, Rehan Jalali, has been on the show not not once, but twice. And uh, so I think this is a first. We've, we're, we're doing a sibling duo. That works. I'm I'm into the family thing, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> nice. for sure, for sure. Nice. The the Jalalis, for those who may not know, uh, is are, are an institution in Houston. So, uh, and now all over because uh, Rehan doesn't live in Houston and uh, Adnan doesn't live in Houston. But uh, shout out to Adnan Jalali as well. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, yeah, Sadi and I go way, way, way back, um, and. Uh, uh, it's just great to be able to kind of have have you on this platform. I know you and I have shared other platforms in the past um, in a long history together, working in the Muslim community in Houston and elsewhere. But uh, yeah, super excited to have you on this little baby project of ours. Yeah, it feels a little full circle to some degree, right? <laughs> so I will say, here we are. As 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 he introduces me, it's it's uh, you know I've always considered Pervez my teacher. He is somebody that has been my teacher since my teenage years, and will continue to be inshallah for a very long time. And I'm always indebted for his uh, instilling this interest in Islam in me. So I'm I'm actually forever indebted. Alhamdulillah. So. Oh, God, you didn't have to say that. Um, but uh, thank you. Um, people can't see me, luckily, but I'm blushing. Uh, but, uh, you know, thank you, Sadia. And uh, 
it was wonderful. And, and we, and we have so much history um, with Muslim support group and, and just all the work we've done in Houston together. And, and those are fond memories that I will always cherish. And uh, as much as it was an informative period in your life, it was an informative period in my life. So um, thank you for that. Um, and Omar, you uh, kind of tangentially come into the MSG picture, as it were, uh, being an attendee, being an attendee of, uh, of a couple of our functions. Well, I was telling Sadia uh, just before we, we started recording. Um, I was thinking, yeah, this hey, is you- like a reunion. This yeah. is like an MSG <laughs> to reunion. Well, I mean, her face is very familiar to me because I remember I was I was the kid cousin who visited regularly. Right. So I was saying, hey, maybe you remember me as that, that cousin who would randomly come over every couple of years and hang out for the summer. Uh, but anyway, no, no, this, I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I was just going to say super important topic as well. Uh, we're hoping to talk about marriage in the Muslim community uh, and, and all the all the nuance and complexities that, that come with it. Uh, where we're, we're, a lot of us are, you know, uh, children of immigrants that comes with some some uh, interesting complexity. And then uh, there's just a lot to unpack. So really looking forward to the conversation. And I, and Pervez, I stole your term there. A lot to unpack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there there is a lot to unpack. Um, so I guess we'll kind of dive right into it. I, you know, and and I guess before we get into uh, talking about marriage and relationships, perhaps uh, in particular, um, we can kind of just sort of segue by, you know, Sadi, I'd I'd love for you to kind of comment on what you think are common misconceptions um, or common narratives just with regards to mental health in general, uh, because I think that growing up, as Omar mentioned, children of immigrants, we, we were always kind of taught this narrative that, oh, you know, you are somehow sheltered from quote unquote American problems because of your religion or because of your, um, you know, fidelity to this community or to this, you know, way of life. Uh, but that, as we know, in our own lives, doesn't play out that way. And, and we're, grappling with many of the same issues that quote unquote American, you know, youth or Americans face at at large. So maybe kind of talk a little bit about that, because obviously, I think, I mean, the profession you chose, and I'd love to also for you to kind of talk a little bit about um, your own background and what what led you to pursue um, your own interest in psychology and, 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 and Muslim family life. Um, So maybe kind of talk about that. And then you can kind of maybe respond to the question that I asked. Yeah, um, it's it's a great question in terms of, you know, um, our community. I mean, thankfully, alhamdulillah, I'll say in 2020, a lot has changed. Um, it's been amazing that I've seen, you know, there's a new thing coming out um, actually from the Khalil Center called Traditional Islamically Integrated Psychotherapy. I mean, that's... I can't even explain the excitement. That's like me fangirling all over the place because just to hear the idea of psychotherapy and Islamically, you know, just putting, merging these two things that are not foreign, they are not, you know, in and of themselves, something to to be separated. And so things like that, I'll say, alhamdulillah, our community has moved a long way, but absolutely. I mean, I think growing up, um, mental health just wasn't, psychology just wasn't real, frankly. I don't even know how else to put it, you know, Um, especially, I would say, the immigrant community, I don't think psychology was even a, a valid point of study. You know, um, we joke that it's like, well, it's like the people that didn't make it as doctors or didn't want to be doctors <laughs> chose like psychology. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing is, is I think my own interest developed kind of over time. I think there was always, I took like an intro class in high school once and was like, wow, this is fascinating. Like the science of human behavior, you know, it was uh, amazing to me. Um, I always wanted to understand, I guess, kind of I'm a natural maybe social scientist um and so but but over time but again it was that wasn't a real field so you know I go to college and I'm doing my undergrad was in psychology but it started in a whole lot of other things um basically getting to be convincing my parents that this is an okay route um and then, you know, trying to move on and uh, do my master's, you know, I noticed that, you know, within the marriage and family therapy field, there really people, you know, the, the community had needs and a lot of people weren't seeking counseling because no one looked like them. The person across mm. the room was somebody they'd have to say, explain so much cultural background to, to finally get the help they need or to feel even understood and validated. So that was one of the initial reasons I went into it was I was like, you know, this is such a lacking in our community. And if you, you're not culturally sensitive, um, having to explain so much about 
why you, you even just what you look like when you get into a room, it, it just it starts the whole therapy process. It's just, it, you know, 10 steps back. So that was kind of my own, you know, trajectory and wanting to get into it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll, I will say in, in that 15 years or so, we, our community's come a long way. There's a whole lot more being addressed that mental health is a, is a valid thing. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Don't get me wrong. We still have a very long way to go. Um, people have many misconceptions of, you know, a therapy or any of these things are only if, quote, you're crazy, you know, if people that, you know, can't get their lives together. Um, one of the things that's very frustrating to me as a therapist is, for particularly a marriage therapist, is people tend to come way too late. It's like when mm. they hate each other and they really kind of want out, it's like their Hail Mary pass, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, ah, uh, I'm not a wizard. I don't wave wands and things don't change, you know? Like, if you really hate each other walking in this room, I'm not sure there's a lot I'm going to do about that. So it's, it's a, it's a, that's probably the struggle at this point is to seek the help when it's best. Yeah. Um, no, thank you for that. And, 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 and I think you raised a couple of issues that I, I would really like to follow up on before. Yeah. I mean, and, and you did, you know, uh, answer the question that I asked earlier, which is like to deal with, uh, w w or my question has to do with stigma, like the stigma of seeking a therapist or seeking mental health or seeking a mental health professional. Like, do you feel that that stigma and, and we've had past guests on the show and we, and we've talked about, you know, that stigma in general, but have you seen that get better over your course of 14, 15 years of doing this now uh, where, you know, that stigma with seeking counseling or seeking, a th you know, a therapy um, is, 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 um, you know, diminished in the community. Yeah, no, certainly. It, it absolutely has. Um, it, it's, again, still has a lot, a long way to go, but the stigma is, is very real. Um, you know, there, I think in the past, you know, there, the people that root struggled, struggled with sort of like more severe mental illnesses. So you're talking like the bipolar disorders and the, the schizophrenias and things, uh, in our community, they were just hidden. They were simply shunned. They were put into this, you know, this thing, this very private, terrible matter we have to deal with. And it was never discussed publicly, things like that. And so I, I think that we, we've we've moved from that to at least acknowledging it, wanting to seek that help. Um, and yet, uh, again, we have a long way to go. And part of what I want people to understand is that, you know, uh, many people say, you know, everyone should have a therapist. <laughs> and what that really just means is the therapeutic process. I mean, it's a whole range of sort of things. Uh, yes, we do treat some, um, you know, uh, more difficult sort of mental illnesses, but we, you know, especially marriage and family therapists, we also treat your day-to-day -day problems that sometimes you need some clarity and some insight and some self-awareness in your life. And so it doesn't have to be that, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling like you're losing your mind or, you know, something is terribly wrong or you're so anxious, you're having panic attacks or you're so depressed, you haven't left your bed in two weeks. Like it doesn't have to get to such extremes to seek out this type of help. And I, that's where I feel like that our community hasn't quite landed in that spot yet. And, and I would I would just kind of connect what you just said with Barbara's very first point, which is that 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 clarity or self understanding. Maybe you call it EQ, right? I think what I've seen, uh, and maybe even a little of what I experienced, was that your EQ growth is a bit stunted, uh, or was our you know ours growing up the eighties and nineties as Muslims, because those things that uh, you maybe could have helped you grow and mature, you didn't you didn't lean into those because you were like, Oh, that's not going to affect me. That's a, that's a non-Muslim issue. So I'm not going to even think about that or like see how it would relate to me because it just has nothing to do with me. I'm going to go back to seeing if I can, you know, uh, find some halal gelatin or something like that. Right. I'm just, uh, I'm just giving that example as a joke, but you know, it really, I, I felt like, um, by not embracing those issues as things that could affect us, the growth was stunted. And my guess is as a, as a, as a professional now, you're probably seeing some of that, some of those people who had that experience uh, now come to you in their thirties, forties, fifties, and maybe they're, 
EQ is a little lacking or behind, right? Which is kind of ties back to what you said. By the time they come to you, they hate each other in the case of marriage, marriages uh, that need help. Yeah, that's actually such a great point in terms of I see a lot of uh, essentially adult children, right, who are still dealing with issues with their parents who have now gotten into their own marriages. And because their family dynamic wasn't maybe supportive of, you know, therapeutic means or treatments or just psychology at all, um, they're bringing that kind of baggage into their own families. You know, mm-hmm. and so there's these people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, as you're saying that have kind of in the last few years been like, oh, I have some things I need to work through. You know, I had some feelings when I was a kid that I don't think I ever addressed or even recognized at the time. And that's what I mean. That insight and self-awareness um, can be part of the therapeutic process. It's part of that journey of like, okay, there's clearly some things I just put to the side, as you said, maybe just had other priorities uh, kind of were invalidated to make it seem like it can't be your problem. And so, you know, as an adult, you're like, no, I, I know enough now and I've come across enough in life to know this isn't right. You know, there is something not okay going on here. And so that's what a lot of, um, as you said, sort of older folks are coming in to say, okay, there, you know, I need to, I need to dig into this a little deeper here. Yeah. Um, I, and, and just for the uninitiated, um, you know, EQ, emotional, um, uh, quotient, um, and, and just, uh, that kind of, um, emotional, uh, maturity, um, but I think, yeah, Umar, you raised some great points and, 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 uh, uh, in, in terms of, there's almost this sense, and I don't think this is limited just to the Muslim community or even immigrant community, at, you know, in general. I think it's something that we even see in society, which is like even the like the minute I say terms like triggering or trauma or emotional quotient, right? EQ. Uh, there, there are people that are going to dismiss it as, oh, you're just a snowflake, or you need to toughen up. Right. And so there's almost like a discounting that goes in. Um, would you agree with that, Sadia? Like, and, or, and if you do or if you don't, but if, if you do agree with that kind of assessment, is it something, you know, that is perhaps more pervasive among men than it is women? Yeah, actually, those are two really great points. I'm going to address them a little bit separately. So the first point was, I think that, and when we see this in many types of societal trends, there's always sort of a pendulum swing of things, right? So it went from, you know, children aren't seen and not heard, to, you know, aren't to be uh, heard, but only seen, or, you know, this whole thing where between parenting, between marriage, between families, marriage was a duty, Mar- you know, like there's just these certain things. Okay, then, it, you know, psychology is not real, whatever. Then there was this huge swing of, you know, when emotional quotient, even that term, you know, that terminology became popularized when pop psychology became a thing, triggers, boundaries, you know, these words all were out there. Then now we're kind of starting to hit this other weird place where it's like, oh, okay, you're one of those, what, I don't know, like crunchy granola hippies. I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know, I'm not totally. Really no, 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 absolutely. People, but there's something, you know, we, we're swinging back where we're like, oh, okay, you're one of those. It's kind of like we're categorizing them, you know, into this. That's thing. right. Like, oh, find your little safe space and, and you know, and, and, and trigger free zone. Right. Um, yeah, it, it's very dismissive. And, and you almost have this kind of, like you said, I think you beautifully described it as kind of a pendulum swing because I think what we're, what we're seeing also is kind of a response to people taking mental health seriously. And that response is this kind of, and I'm not going to name names, but like, or, or I will like the kind of Jordan Peterson's of the world, which is like to just discount all of this wholesale because uh, you know uh, yeah, they just don't like the fact that people are uh, you know, talk about triggering and talk about trauma and so on. So it's really interesting. Like, I, I think you, I think you kind of nailed it with regards to how societal trends tend to be like a pendulum. You know, one, to, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sadia. No, to the, to that point, you know, when you're talking about men, I, I wanted to make sure I hit that. Oh yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, oh gosh. Um, I could probably do a whole separate, you know, completely separate session with you guys on, you know, and, 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 and I say that because, you know, for, for men, um, I've realized this over time, the way they connect with their friends is through activity as opposed to just chit chat. Girls can hang out, do absolutely nothing, sit on a couch and not move for four hours and have the time of their lives. Okay. But boys don't do that. They're activity based. Hey, let's go play ball. Hey, let's play some games. Hey, let's go out. Let's go eat something. Let's go do this. It, it's something we're, we're going to do things. We're not going to sit here and just chit chat. 
because then we might have to deal with our feelings or might, you know, we might have to address that I'm not great right now. I don't have it all together or I don't know what the heck I'm doing in my life or I have no purpose. You know, these things that men have felt or boys, I would say, and then, you know, becoming men, they don't have a space with amongst their friends typically amongst their siblings, amongst their families, you know, there's kind of that man up mentality, like, you know, and so I think for men, um, this whole thing, say last five to 10 years has tried to really focus, I'd say really five years, tried to really focus on them to say, hey, that's not healthy. That's not, nothing about that has made you a better person by ignoring that entire side of your needs. Everyone has those needs as humans, men and women. And so I think now, again, we're starting to, the pendulum swing back a little bit the other way to be like, oh, you're just a sissy or whatever, you know, you've, right. you're too much in your feels, you have too many emotions. And so it's an interesting thing. Um, I do think that we, at whoever is sort of raising sons, I think needs to be very mindful of this pattern of how do you get them to be okay with feelings that they're okay they're a part of your world um so not a lot like as muslims our prophetic tradition is so opposite of this yeah. like the prophet right. was very in touch with his emotions he's not in a, a he wasn't a robot he wasn't some sort of only you know one way of being and i'm, I'm always put together and i'm always you know it just wasn't like that you know he he wept at sad moments in life, right? I mean, there, there is this exchange of vulnerability that he was willing to have with his companions. And I just think men are absolutely missing that at this point in their lives. And, and Muslim, the, the risk of uh, Muslim boys uh, not embracing that, that EQ development is that they're going to stay boys for a very long time. And, and I'll give you, I'll give you a, um, just a personal anecdote. I mean, I've met, I've talked about this on the show a lot. I grew up with mostly non-Muslims, right? Give or take. Um, and my friend's parents uh, would be really happy when they, when they went to homecoming or prom, the prom uh, instead of just like going out there and, and uh, playing baseball or basketball on their bikes or, uh, you know, buying, buying baseball cards or comic books or whatever. Cause to the parents, it was, Hey, my kid's growing up. This is part of this, the next stage, right? Um, and, and, and this kind of ties back to the first point. It's like we as Muslims, we weren't allowed to do some of those things. And therefore, we kind of reverted back to our, our baseball cards and our, and our sports and, and, and our gyms, right? Those things you described as how men bond. And then come marriage time, right? You, you, then you have to catapult straight past the boy the, those several stages and you jump directly into marriage right and and um probably you can attest to this a lot of muslim boys are not prepared for uh for marriage and, and not to pick on just one gender uh, i'm just i'm just talking about this one particular example i'm sure there's applicable conversations about uh muslim women as well but just since you brought that example up um so just to, you know, your thoughts on that whole point of how do you, how do you, while retaining your Islamic principles, um, get through those natural, those processes naturally as in, in the time frame that they should No, I, And Omar, I, I mean, sorry, Sadia, before you answer, I, I, I would only add that I, I think you're right. And I don't think it's just, again, necessarily something unique to American Muslims or uh, American or, or as Americans, children of immigrants. Because I think like even back home, there's this idea that if a, if a guy, if a boy if, or a man, a young man is immature or he hasn't fully blossomed and matured yet, then marriage is the cure. Like, but just so that right? Like, like he'll, res he'll, he'll reform himself once he gets married or, you know, and so this idea that, that somehow, you know, you can take an immature, you know, boy and he'll become suddenly embrace manhood um and 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 maturation and responsibility just by virtue of getting married you know that's actually one of the sorry uh, Pabia, I, I, yeah if you want to comment or if you say, I, I guess even to omar's can, question um yeah and it sounds like it's like the approach of throwing someone into the, the deep end of the pool right that that uh urdu phrase you mentioned so yeah Perfez, that's actually a really great point um you know, that it's actually one of my biggest frustrations. It seems to be any answer to a, a, a guy not doing what you want is marry him off. That's the solution to everything. Oh, he has some, you know, addictions. Oh, no, no, just get him married. <laughs> That'll fix him. He'll learn responsibility. He can't be an addict while he's still married. You know, there's these terrible 
uh, ways that we think, especially back home, but it's even here too. Some of that has unfortunately seeped into the American Muslim landscape. Um, the idea of, you know, uh, marriage being sort of the solution to becoming a man. And, you know, to Umar's point earlier, um, you know, just the idea of, you're right, I think as American Muslims, especially these first generation, you know, Muslims that came and, and their children, they were so concerned with maintaining that Muslim identity or that cultural identity that, oh, going to prom, going to homecoming or whatever, any of these extra things, you know, getting too involved in all that quote Americanness, right? Um, that would be scary for them. And that was too far for them. It was too uncomfortable for them. And so I think that was, you know, that that's that stunted some of the independence that's needed, some of the just emotional growth and maturity that you could have had by attending some of these other things. You know, there'd be like, say, a you know, a trip out of town and in, in high school, maybe, or, you know, things like that. And a lot of parents wouldn't allow for that. You know, uh, they wouldn't allow their kids to go out of town for school, right, for colleges. So there was some of this stunting that took place, um, you know, so it only sort of, you know, continued with men, you know, not being able to really, like, gain that independence. Um, and then again, yes, oh, go get married. And all of a sudden, responsibility will be so natural to you. You know, it's such a bizarre, you know, kind of uh, thought process there. So I and that's, yeah. and that's a good, I probably, uh, if you, you know, thought I'd just kind of use that as a segue to uh, talk about some of the prerequisites to marriage. And, and what, here, what I'm talking about is a lot of my friends, uh, again, my non-Muslim friends, they lived, lived with, they moved in with their fiancés or girlfriends or fiancés. And obviously the solution for us as Muslims is not to do everything that, uh, you know, non-Muslims do. I think it's more about, being aware of the, the, the gaps that, that could result in, in terms of maturity and, and key EQ development. But um, my question is the, you know, as we were in 2020, the world is very complex place. Personalities are not, you know, are, are infinite uh, and so on and so forth. It's in, in, in the West, the understanding in the anonymous world, the understanding is, Hey, you have to live with this person to really get to know them. Uh, just kind of sagging into what is required or, or what would you recommend uh, before marriage? Like, how do Muslims prepare for marriage? And, 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 and things like living together are obviously off the table for most Muslims. So what, what would be your thoughts on that? Like, the preparation for, for marriage um, within the bounds of, like, accept what's acceptable within Islam? Yeah, you know, that's a that's a really important point. So um, it, it's so interesting you brought that up. So I'm a huge proponent proponent of premarital education and premarital counseling. Um, I think that is one of the most important things that our community is a good 10 to 15 years behind everyone else on. Um, if not further, you know, um, for example, like the Catholic Church will not marry you unless you do a required six months of premarital training. You will, they the church will not allow you to marry, you know, um, or they won't marry you. And so so I know there's been several um, cities that are trying and imams, you know, personally, but like in Houston, we have kind of an umbrella organization. A lot of the imams are trying to commit to say something like, look, we don't want to perform your nikah until you've had some premarital training, some premarital education. Um, it's not quite fully required. You know, you got to get a lot of people on board and change a lot of minds to get to that point. But I really hope and pray our community does get there. Um, so in Texas, there was a statistic that was... Um, came out a few years back and that's why the state actually you know, put a ton of money into premarital education programs was um, if if a couple took eight hours of premarital education and training, their likelihood of divorce went down by 85%. And that is a ridiculous statistic, wow, <laughs> you know, in yeah. terms of, you know, effectiveness, right? And so right. Um, part of what Muslim Bliss, what, you know, when you mentioned in my intro, you know, part of what I want to do and have kind of started to do is create a Muslim friendly curriculum for premarital training. Um, I've actually gotten certified in like three to four other non, you know, kind of secular uh, premarital programs. And and just really having done this work for a few years now, I, I'm, I'm trying to really integrate um, you know, Muslim principles and concepts within our concepts of marriage. You know, we have a very, we have a lot of beautiful, be it verses, hadith, you know, lots of things in our tradition to understand this family dynamic and this particular relationship in marriage. So premarital training is one huge one. And then secondly, what I would say is that, you know, there's a lot of ways to do this now without 
just crossing bounds, right? There's, there's, you know, you can, you can publicly spend some time together. You can spend time with your families. You can do things to get to know that person without it having to be, I have to live with you. I mean, you know, you can do, do your research, right? It's kind of like, you know, do your due diligence and getting to know this person. Um, the other tip I would say is definitely get to know their family. You know, people, um, it's not, fully true but some when some say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree you know some of there is some truth to that you know there is some you know genetic sort of you know things and just uh family systems and family dynamics are generational it is a multi-generational thing and so you know getting to know the family getting to know their dynamics getting to know the model of marriage that that person has seen and if they think that was healthy or not i mean this is all stuff we would have done in you know premarital counseling um so those types of things i think you know there are absolutely ways to get to know a person without having to cross all of our some bounds that that we obviously try to stay within um so that that's kind of where i would sit with with that is just hoping and praying inshallah the community does get more on board with the premarital counseling yeah, you know, it's 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 remarkable. Uh, a lot of the things you just mentioned, um, you know, there was a great I, I saw this thread on uh, Twitter uh, where it was an it was an imam, a scholar who kind of uh, 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 posted a uh, kind of a checklist for young couples getting married or actually it was it was it was it was addressing um, guardians. Uh, so like, you know, within the Islamic like within a nikah you have a wali or someone who's like a legal guardian. And so, you know, his, his checklist was really about, you know, trying to speak to um, what a, a a person who is a wali or a legal guardian should do before, you know, uh, before their son or their daughter more specifically gets married. And, and it was a lot of the things you're talking about, which is, you know, uh, getting to know the other family, obviously seeing those kind of dynamics, but also like their peer group, also social media. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about social media a little bit later, but even within this context of marriage and getting to know someone, um, you know, do your due diligence, like you said. And I mean, so people are putting everything on social media these days. Um, it's almost, in, you know, in, inescapable. And in fact, I would, I would argue that a lot of our children, for example, our children's generation, this new generation, um, them especially, everything's on social media. So it's like you can really get a sense of what a person is, um, but just to, just by virtue of social media. Uh, in fact, I, I'm seeing, and Omar can probably vouch for this from an HR perspective, but um, you know, uh, social media posts and so on uh, being taken into consideration for hiring and firing decision, uh, decisions. So anyway, yeah, I mean, if you, I don't know if you've seen anything that, or stories that you, you would, you, you think are germane to that, but, you know, definitely doing your due diligence, like you said. No, absolutely. I think social media is like, I mean, it's just a whole, whole thing. <laughs> um, as you said, I think this will be very telling in our children's generation when they're trying to get married and whatnot, because their digital footprint is just massive, right? Even, you know, it, it, it's just, I mean, you're right. Every single thing is chronicled about their lives. And so, and, and, you know, I, I, subhanAllah, man, I will tell you, I am so grateful this was not a thing in the nineties because I can't imagine my 10, 12, 15, 17 year old brain, you know, just commenting and posting about everything and all my, my not great thought out thoughts, you know, I don't know if I would ever want a public log of that type of thought, make, you know, this terrible decision making probably, and, you know, just un, you know, immature sort of thoughts. I'm so grateful that was not a thing back then I <laughs> about our children. Cause I'm like, I don't know if you would want to ever see this again when you're much older. If it's any conciliation, I'll, I'll say having known you probably between the ages of 12 and 17, um, you, you didn't have a whole lot to be embarrassed. <laughs> oh, so one, oh. one question uh, you know, before we move on, which we're talking about like the pre-marriage phase and, and I'm sure we'll talk about marriage and, and also divorce as well. But, but maybe one question before we move on to, to the marriage aspect of the conversation. Um, what are some, and just anecdotally, what are some things other than just lack of getting to know the other family, the parents, um, you know, talking values and goals and things like that? Just anecdotally, what are some other pre-marital mistakes that kids and not kids just people getting married these days are making i mean whether it's having the wrong priorities or just any anecdotally any mistakes or that you're seeing as a trend 
Yeah. So, you know, a few things, right? There's, there's a lot of rushing. Um, and that's the, you know, the timeline thing within Muslims is always so confusing, right? So we, we hear from our tradition, there's this concept of like, you know, sort of like don't delay and this idea, right? And I don't know if, you know, we've figured out that and it's not that there's, it's not cookie cutter, right? There can't be a perfect timeline for anybody, but the idea of just rushing into it can really be problematic. Um, it means you did not, you just didn't have time to do the due diligence. There's no time to sort of get to know a person's character. You know, how can you say, I know this person's character in a ma- matter of two months or one month even, right? And it's just, so there's, you know, the idea of rushing it, that can be very problematic. The other thing, so there's two other, I think I would say big things. One is, there is a, not a lot of self-awareness going in. As you said, maybe because psychologically they're a little stunted or just immature, there wasn't a lot of independence allowed in their home. And so they're going into these marriages as like babies, like they're just little children trying to play house, you know? And so um, obviously not the later, maybe second marriages or later people that are getting married, but those first time marriages, you know, um, they they just, it, it, it seems like, you know, they they don't even know what their triggers are. They don't even know that's a thing. They don't know what boundaries are. They don't know, um, especially with, I would say, the current generation getting married. Um, we just mentioned social media. That's a whole nother ballgame, right? The boundaries issue of what's allowed, what's not allowed. Do you have front, you know, the opposite gender on your social media? What does that look like? How often do you talk? You know, there's a whole, what are you posting out there? What's public? What's private? I mean, that's a whole nother thing where if, again, these couples are not spending enough time together having these type of conversations, that's very problematic. Um, and then again, the idea of, you know, just not knowing themselves. They don't even know what they want, right? It's this melding of what my parents want, what I think I want, what society's telling me I should want, what I think my religion is telling me I should want. And they just really have no idea, you know? Um, there's that. There's also the, you know, just falling in love too hard and the love the blinders of love kind of on where you um didn't appropriately uh look into the red flags. There are typically red flags that come up during that courtship process. And if you're too emotionally attached at that point, you will overlook them all. You will not do a proper sort of investigation into what that was. And I, I heard somewhere that, uh, you know, it's anywhere from 18 to 24 months before that, 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 uh, those uh, uh, butterflies, if you will, those, those, uh, those you know, the, 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 honeymoon the, phase. the honeymoon phase. Yeah, yeah. Before you really get to know someone and, and can look at them objectively, it's, it's 18 to 24 months. Yeah, see, so think about the Muslim context in that, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, we don't we don't like long courtships, we don't like long engagements. And I mean, I I understand that, too. You know, there's always got to be, I think, a balance to these things. Um, But can you imagine that that's, you know, then then we're really, you know, on the short end of that stick right there. So I think that's, that's one thing is just, you know, trying to how do you get to know a person with not having just such an emotional attachment that, you, you know, you'll just overlook those, those red flags. You know, I really think, subhanAllah, like Allah gives us something, that intuition, that gut feeling, you know, something's in there, you know, and, and you can't, when you ignore it and overlook it, you're really potentially, you know, entering into some dangerous territory. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and I think, I, I mean, what you mentioned um, about, I mean, not 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 explicitly, but I think what you mentioned reminded me of this idea that you know it's important for us to view and analyze our own tradition, be it religious or cultural, uh, within context, right? Within its historical and traditional context. So, for example, I agree. You know, there is this propensity, uh, it, you know, and it, and it stems from Muslim tradition to not delay marriage. You know, uh, the Prophet, you know, peace be upon him, warning not to turn away potential suitors if they're iman, you know, if they're, if they're of good character, but that is within a context where everybody kind of knew each other. I mean, society was small society, you know, was largely homogenous. Um, we're dealing with a far more complex situation now. Um, and then even culturally speaking, you know, I, I feel like, you know, there's this shelf life, you know, you talked about rushing into things, you know, there's almost like a shelf life that, 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 that parents put on their children, be it men, or I think, especially female, um, again, culturally speaking, uh, where, oh my God, she's 25. She's never going to get married. 
Um, you know, she's 26. She's never going to get married. So, so I, I think that, yeah, viewing all of those uh, traditional and cultural practices within their proper context. And like you said, not allow that to, um, you know, you know, cause someone to rush into something or not do their proper due diligence and really getting to know someone. So, and, and pivoting now, maybe now is a good time to pivot to the kind of the marriage phase of things. Right. And, Perfect. and, 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 uh, uh, what my question is, what are some of the things that couples can do early on in the marriage to kind of set the, the right foundation? Uh, and, and, uh, uh Jokingly, I'll say men men can buy a a, a scale, right? <laughs> just to be uh, uh, just to be self aware there, but uh, but no, seriously, what what can people do like in the early days, right, to to get on the right path? Yeah, you know that's a, a really great question. What I will say is that our community is a little behind on the whole. Like, you know, if you look at the way churches are set up in terms of their the different ministries they have, there's usually like some. A lot of the churches have like a marriage ministry, where there's um, and it's set up in several different ways. But the idea of like say o- older established couples will kind of partner and buddy up with a new couple first year in marriage and be kind of like their you know go to like hey you know what we we're in a thing and we're not really sure what we're doing. You know, we don't really um, help folks, right? We don't do much. You know, you, you're kind of like, hey, you two random individuals go play house. Yay, we're done. You know, it's like we don't do a lot of support for that time frame, And that's actually when, you know, I'll tell you something. I see couples and I'm like, I wish I saw you year one, year two, year three, you know, like that is where I can be effective in Like that's, that is where therapy, um, marriage counseling, these things can be so helpful. You don't, you know, coming when it's so broken is so difficult to fix. So come at the, the, the onset of something like, Hey, you know what, we're having a disagreement and we're not communicating well about it. You know, learning communication skills, obviously, like I mentioned, if you did premarital training, that's one step, but if you're already married and whatever you did, or you did not do the premarital training, um, this is where therapy could be extremely beneficial to you. You know, you learn these quick tips, tricks, tools, you know, to kind of be able to uh, set your future going for, you know, down that right path. Um, So that's definitely one thing that I would say, again, you know, the the community would kind of have some sort of more organized structure around how do we support early marriages? I think that would be, you know, very beneficial as well. Um, The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, having some sort of um, just a, a, a structure, even if not, say, the community's job obligation within your family, within friends of like, hey, this is this couple that we really trust. You know, maybe they can become our kind of like, hey, I need to talk to you about, I need, we need some help. And we're just, you know, having a little disagreement, need, need a third party to kind of, you know, just navigate this for us. If you're not maybe ready to go down the therapy route, you know, at least having some social support to get through that beginning phase because there is, you know, reality hits hard and fast, right? You know, they're, they're saying the honeymoon phase is, you know, the 18 to 24. I mean, for some, it's much less. It's, you know, it's like a six month thing. It's a three month thing, right? It's kind of like, I thought so amazing of you. And now uh, living with you is such a different experience, right? Where we're different, we have different habits and stuff. So, I mean, I think having just social support, emotional support of how do we get through these times and having maybe you know, either be it elders or just some wiser folks have done this a little bit um, that can guide you, I think could be very beneficial. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I, you know, one that didn't even cross my mind in terms of like kind of having like a mentorship program almost. I mean, not, you know, not like nothing official or, uh, you know, designed as a mentorship program, but yeah, having people in your own community, in your own families, perhaps even that you can go to, um, you know, and, and kind of um, see as, and, and just kind of yeah, to kind of talk through some of the problems that you're having as a young married couple um, to people who've been more seasoned in their marriages, I guess, as it were. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And many people will tell you when, you know, um, when you first get married, a lot of people will be like, oh, oh, don't worry, that won't bother you five years later. (laughs) Oh, don't worry. This, you know, you kind of learn, you know, uh, you learn over time what to make a thing of and what to not make a thing of, you know, like you learn to um, deal with what, what can you let go? What can you not? 
you know. Um, and I think early on in the marriage, you kind of come in with such rose colored glasses um, that initially it's all great. And then slowly, slowly, you know, you start to whether the lenses fade or something happens and you're like, you know, no, this thing actually really bothers me. You know, this is really not OK. And so it's it's just one of those times where what do you do at that point? You know, to me, oh, my gosh, go see a professional. <laughs> you could probably knock that out in like three sessions, two sessions. You know, you just need some tools and some, you know, techniques and some proper communication, really. And you can really resolve most of anything. You know, most of the issues we're really coming at is really communication. And when there's a breakdown in that, you can't, you can't even talk about the problem, right? How do you solve mm-hmm. a problem when it, there's no discussion to be had? So and, and that's this, really the big breakdown. And this kind of goes to the generational point, right? Because uh, previous generations, they only considered the marriage to be broken or even having problems that there was like abuse or like infidelity or something something major like that. Right. And, and I guess, uh, you know, the term first world problems comes to, comes to mind, but these are real, real problems now, but they're much more nuanced. They're, it's, it's not necessarily these big things that are causing problems. It's personality differences, little annoyances, lack of maybe lack of just nurturing the, the marriage or, or communication skills, personality skill, personalities care, you know, that sort of thing. Right. So is that, is that also your experience? You're getting a lot more people with not these, issues of violence and abuse and infidelity and uh, addiction and so forth, but just chemistry, if you will. Right. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a, those are two really great points and, you know, I'll bring one up just to say, you know, I think we'll talk about this probably, you know, a little later, but in terms of divorce, you know, we, unfortunately, culturally, our community still holds some of that where you would never leave a marriage unless there was something so glaring, like, you know, infidelity or addictions or beating somebody or, you know, we, we think of abuse only in the physical sense. We don't even know or think about emotional, verbal, mental, physical, psychological, spiritual, you know, there's so many other versions of abuse, but our community tends to kind of go in those extremes. So yes, I will say that's also definitely very generational. Um, The younger generation, is a little bit more attuned to, hey, you know, we, um, you know, we're just not able to talk to each other. We just don't even understand how to talk to each other. We can't communicate. A lot of the younger generation's issues are about what I mentioned earlier, the social media dynamics and, and how that's playing out and what's considered cheating, what's not cheating. You know, there's a lot of really interesting things that happen when technology comes into the picture. Um, mm-hmm. But but you would say they're I would, you know, I guess you could call them more more minor <laughs> offenses um, in the state of the marriage if you're discussing something like, you know, maybe um, domestic violence or, or again, you know, just flat out infidelity and adultery. Um, that that seems to be more of, you know, what people they're recognizing that these are also issues that need need help, and so I'm, I'm grateful yeah. for that. I'd love to drill yeah. down on what you just said. Uh, the whole thing about uh, technology and like the mehram mehram in technology, right? Because I know I've seen it in the next generation where, uh, whereas our generation, we really didn't have friends of the opposite gender. Like uh, at least from, 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 and I'm talking generally speaking, like it was like all these Muslim guys hanging out and then all these Muslim girls. And once in a while there would be some event or something where people got together. But now what I'm seeing among the next generation is like, most people have like friends of the opposite gender and it's all, it's all just uh, right. And, and, and of course, people on social media, <laughs> what's that? I think it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. So what for I'm them, saying for is, them. <laughs> what I'm saying, so I'd love to hear drilling down into that example you talked of, of like, what is cheating with when it comes to social media and how do you keep in touch with old friends and et cetera. So that, that's a pretty interesting uh, case study, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And so I've had many, many um, couples come in where this is just of the utmost concern. Okay, there is this rule where, okay, um, on your Instagram, if someone direct, you know, DMs you, they direct message you and, you know, um, come across as, as flirty or something. Do you respond at all? Do you not respond? Do you respond by saying, no and block them. I mean, we can get into some real nitty gritty. I'm talking, I've had these conversations. I've had these type of sessions where, and that becomes a deal breaker. Like this is prior to getting married, you know, say that becomes deal breakers. Like, oh, if you're not willing to block all the male people, or if you're not uh, willing to privatize your account, as opposed to being a public account, you know, so these are the types of specific ways this is being handled. And what I typically say to people is, listen, 
you as a couple have to come to an agreement. Okay, it's mm-hmm. literally the concept of nikah is two people coming into a contractual agreement. I, I'm agreeing to this, you're agreeing to this, and we are committing to that, right? And the issue happens is when there's a mismatch of the expectations, a mismatch of what you know I thought the boundaries were, right? And so these are very clear conversations that have to happen before the marriage, you know, uh, happens, so that you're on the same page about it. Now, are there you know the rights and wrongs of it? Obviously, right? There's there's friendly and then there's flirty, and and you know we know the difference. I I, I just would think it's uh, silly for someone to say no. I'm not exactly always sure the difference. There, that's a pretty obvious difference when it's a friendly conversation. Maybe somebody from work or somebody you have some some you know previous history with in terms of just community people. You might have a couple interactions, and that's about it. Now, if you're talking about somebody you know, coming into your, you know, uh, private account and, you know, messaging you sending, why would they do that? You always kind of have to go back to their intention to kind of be like, where are we going with this? What's exactly happening here? You know? And, and so I do, I, I tell couples, look, there's a personal accountability factor here, right? At the end of the day, God's always watching. There's a, you know, wh- what do you really think is going on here? And then there's, you owe it to your spouse to be on the same page. Whatever you have agreed to is what you need to uphold. Right. And so I, I feel that that this is a very, um, I always tell couples, I said, this is Shaitan's playground. Okay. This is, um, you are playing with fire when you get to that point of thinking everyone is well-intentioned because they're just not, you know, right. and, and this is, they're just not, I, I don't know what else to say. Not everyone I'm saying, you know, again, there's, you know, in I, what I do tell people is these are not black and whites. There's very few sort of black and whites here, except for, again, you know, there are some. But a lot of this has to be you as a couple need to get on the same page. That's just the biggest thing. You know, I can tell you because people will say, oh, well, what's your opinion? What do you think of it? You know, we will say, OK, yeah. I'll tell you my general idea. But that doesn't actually matter if you two are not on the same page, you know. That's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, and, and it could relate to, uh, you know, friends like Omar talked about. I mean, it, 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 perhaps a more changing dynamic with the new generation. But, you know, uh, hey, so and so has very close friends that like like let's, let's say the husband has, you know, uh, very close friends of the opposite gender from prior to getting married. So what are the boundaries of communicating and keeping in touch with friends um, you know, and again, I'm not even talking about the, I mean, putting aside the Islamic position about these things, but just from a healthy marriage and relationship standpoint, like you said, I think those need to be communicated and, and vice versa, right? I mean, women, mar- wives coming into the marriage who have very close male friends or mm-hmm. have enjoyed, you know, have always been sort of accustomed to um, being friendly and having friends of both genders, so, you know, that's, I, I, yeah, I think, I think you nailed it when, you know, you keep reinforcing this idea of um, establishing boundaries and communicating those boundaries between the, between the marriage. And right. what's and with they, tricky, what's tricky is that technology is evolving very fast, right? Because 20 years ago, there was no Facebook. Um, 10 years ago, there was no Instagram. And three years ago, there was no TikTok, right? And each of those is totally different. I mean, I remember when in 2007, um, Facebook came, you know, Facebook took off and everybody just added everybody because they didn't know any better. <laughs> it was just the thing to do. Right. Um, so it's, 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 it's pretty interesting because uh, you have, you have the technology moving at a, at a, at a lightning speed uh, as well. Absolutely. So I think that speaks to more understanding what the boundaries are to you, right? That's why I keep right. emphasizing that is that if you set those boundaries, it doesn't matter which technology you're dealing with, you know, there won't be ways to parse that. It'll just be, this is what we believe. This is how we feel. One thing I'll, I'll say about this, and I want to add this point is trust is so fundamental in marriage. I mean, trust is such a fundamental foundational piece of marriage that if, if this becomes a problem, you know, I always tell couples that have this issue, like, you know, uh, you know, maybe somebody's not as good at holding their boundaries. What I say to them is, listen, you know, you don't want to be an investigator in your marriage, right? You don't want to be like constantly checking someone's phone, having to stay on top of them, having all their passwords, you know, and that's fine that you do. I'm not saying that's wrong. What I'm saying is, do you want to be in a situation where you feel the need to have to go do that and actually check and actually, you know, that trust being not there, it's it's very hard to live like that. It's not healthy you know, to be Mm. sort of in this investigative spy mode all the time, you know, there is something going on, you know, you need to have a different conversation, like what is happening, that this is not 
you know, you can't live like that where you just let, let people be and kind of trust that things are okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've been, and I think in some ways this probably relates to what we've been talking about, but I've had this question, um, uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention and to ask you really was, um, so, and I guess before I ask the question, I'm going to probably just kind of, you know, give you kind of my, um, uh, like the, where the question is coming from. So the context of the question, which is like, I, I, the way I see it is, um, is, is that not only have family structures changed, um, relationships have changed. So like the husband and wife dynamic, I think is fundamentally very different today than it was, uh, certainly during our parents' generation. And why is, what I mean by that is there's, th- there's these greater expectations placed on the spouse to fill and to play so many different roles. Whereas in the past, either because of um, integrated families, i.e. non-nuclear families, or just the way that society was constructed and structured where, you know, men went out and they had their friends and they hung out with their guy friends and they did guy things, right? And they just got that energy out. Um, Nowadays, with the nuclear family, especially, it's really where the husband and wife have to be the end all be all um, for each other. So, you know, and if you'll pardon me, I mean, you know, with regards to one spouse, I mean, that spouse has to be your confidant, your best friend, um, the most amazing lover you've ever had, you know what I mean? Like, so it's just like all these things where, you know, it's, it, it, and so how, I'd love for you to comment on that because I think that is really um, at the core of a lot of the problems that I've seen, um, you know, not only anecdotally, but just, oh, well, I guess, yeah, primarily anecdotally in couples where, yeah, the expectations on the wife or the husband uh, are just so much greater now than they were, like I said, 50 years ago or uh, a generation ago. Yeah, no, that is absolutely an excellent point. Um, and I, I definitely agree with a lot of what you just said in the sense that one of the things that I, I, I warn sort of kind of warn couples of, I would say when I do premarital training is this idea of your spouse is not to be your be all end all. They, they can, nobody can sustain that type of, uh, level of expectation. So one of the things we talk about in the premarital education is the idea of a soulmate. I don't believe in it. And I don't think people Mm. should, because when you put that out there, you're saying there's someone who is so deeply connected to your soul that they will always, always understand you. They will know how to fulfill your every single need and desire ever for the rest of your life. I mean, what kind of expectation are you putting on this? You know, they're not an angel, right? They're not an angel. They're a human, right? They're a faulty, fallible human being, and they're going to make a ton of mistakes, you know? And so when you put them in that best, you know, uh, sexual person that that could ever exist, the best companion in life, the best friend, the best um, travel partner, the best every single thing you could think of, right? Um, It is, you're setting yourself up to fail. The marriage is setting itself up to fail. And so I tell people all the time, couple time is very important. Absolutely prioritize it. But guess what? Individual needs are very important. Individual friendships are important. Individual, you know, family related ties. I mean, just different things. They're extremely significant to not have all this expectation and think this one person is going to fulfill everything for you. It's just, it's truly not possible. And it's not just expectations. I I was just going to say, it's not just expectations. It's also just outside pressure in terms of lifestyle, right? Because, um, again, commutes are longer. uh, Both couple and husband and wife are working. uh, Very few people can afford nannies and and maids and all that sort of stuff, right? So there's there's just a lot, not just of the expectations from the other person, but the kind of the, the, the responsibilities and pressures from the outside world as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just the dual income house has changed things in 30 years dramatically. I mean, just yeah. that just that one change, right? Or structurally, yeah, yeah. that one change has just tremendously changed how, you know, marriage is done. And, and, and maybe for the better and maybe for the worst to some degree, right? And there's some things that maybe you shouldn't have been the way they were, you know, a couple of generations back. So it's not to say that some of this development and uh, growth is not good. It's just that, again, do, have we gone to a place where um, we've we've set ourselves up to fail? That's truly the thing is that you're asking for someone to do things that they're just not capable of. And really, 
um, we're never asked to, you know, even if we look at the prophetic model, we look at, you know, the way the Quran and Sunnah describes the marital relationship and, and, and it, it does not appear to say this person has supposed to be your be all end all. I mean, that's just never been a thing. Yeah, no. And, and I, you know, and, and I would also sort of caution, or I guess one of the, one of the, uh, like, I guess we, you know, w- w- what we were talking about earlier with regards to marriage as being contractual. And I think you use that exact phrase. And I think I, I, it, was, it was so, uh, I'm, I'm so glad you did that because I think when we're talking about tradition, Muslim tradition, I mean, we have to take, uh, we have to own the fact that historically speaking, you know, um, that is how Islam viewed marriage. It viewed it as a contractual relationship. Yes, it was also uh, uh, sacrosanct, and we can talk about that as we get into divorce. But but at the at, at, at you know at, at the outset, it was contractual, and so this all of this a lot of the stuff we're talking about is extrajudicial, if you will. It's 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 outside of the realm of how much can be informed by tradition alone because if if you're coming from the vantage point that or or from the outset that this is a relationship that is contractual then all this fuzzy wuzzy stuff man you know like getting along and liking one another, like all of that is like almost secondary yet so yet yeah. it, is, it is primary it is primary so what uh, then it, is the role? What is the role? Uh, if, 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 if we're looking, this is a question for Sabia, if, what is the role of being quote unquote in love? Right. Uh, what is, well, so if, if you, you don't, if you don't, point. if you don't go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Go no, ahead. Sorry. Go I was just, well, you know what, what Pervez just mentioned is such a great point. So listen, you know, it's, we are, we are, a, we are a balanced people. Okay. So while on one hand, I will say, yes, it is a contractual agreement, right? We are coming to the table saying, these are my terms. These are your terms. Cool. We'll, we'll, we'll do life together. Right. That's kind of the, the legalistic piece. Now yeah. you go back all the way back, right? Why was Hawa created? Companionship. He was lonely. He was bored. Procreation, sure, but there's also just there was a companionship factor. There was a he was lonely, he was alone. You know, there is something to to be said that you know this person does provide some of that fuzzy wuzzy, as you said. You know, no, no, I didn't mean to be dismissive of it. Yeah, no, right, no, no, I I know. What I'm saying is that we have to be, you know, like there there is that, and and yet for sure, right now the current generation is only that. See, this is what I'm saying. You have to balance. Mm, there I is contractual it. obligations, right? And I'm going to, this is going to be not, well, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> it's probably some of Not the most PC. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Uh, you know, I, just, I, I have to say it. I have to say it. Um, I think there is a generation of girls being raised that have a very strange concept, okay, of, of I I'm going to work and you can't stop me and I owe you nothing in this house and I'm not going to clean and I'm not going to cook. And I'm also going to, Oh, actually, you know what? I don't want to work. So I'm going to stay home. I'm going to actually do nothing. And that's it. That's, those are my rights. And it's like, ah, what, you know? And so I just, I, you know, and I'm, again, I'm not, you know, advocating, you know, staying home, cooking and cleaning. I'm not advocating working full time. All I'm saying is I do think there is a strange, even I, no, you know what? I won't just throw women under the bus. Men too. There, you know, there, there's certainly plenty of, as you said, things to go around early on when we're talking. Oh no, absolutely. You know, plenty of things to go around. But this part, I, I worry a little bit because there can't be no, this I, whole, my rights, my rights, my rights, and sort of not understanding, okay, well, what are your responsibilities exactly? Like, where exactly. do you fit no, in no, the future? And, and, and Sadia, I don't want you to feel like you're going out on a limb here because I mean, like, I mean, here you are on a, on a podcast with two men but i mean just again anecdotally <laughs> no no i mean I, it, well, it's a I'm real saying. thing i'm like oh this doesn't sound <laughs> no like, no it totally like, i wholeheartedly agree and it really kind of dovetails to the point that i made about tradition which is i think and, and i and i arguably men are probably more guilty of this but you know maybe we can dissect that and discuss that uh, in terms of who's guilty but that's really not important but the fact is that men do this all the time which is we use tradition uh, uh, very selectively. And it's like, it's like, well, I expect, well, you know, the, the, the home, the household is the domain of the wife. So it's like, you know, rearing children, keeping the house clean. That's right. (laughs) Therefore I'm hands off. Therefore the expectations of running the household are entirely on the woman. But guess what? We also live in California where it's really expensive and I need you to get out there and go and get a, get a job. 
Um, so you know what I mean? And so it's like it's like you want it both ways. You want the Which traditional. Is why you just yeah, you just said the perfect cup, you know, the opposite of what I was saying, you know, for on the, the woman's side, but you just ex- perfectly laid out. This is exactly how this plays out on men, you know, wanting bo- the best of both there. And you're like, again, for both genders, where did your responsibilities lie? You know, what did you come to this agreement into this contractual agreement? What did you come in with exactly? If you're just going to be kind of, you know, jump, dumping down your rights and, you know, hollering those all the time, that's lovely. But what, what are you bringing to the table? Yeah. And, and so you're talking, I, I think, I, I think uh, you're talking about just unrealistic expectations to some degree. You know, I thought you were going to go the route of Bollywood and say, <laughs> say not, not talk about uh, people coming in with uh, unrealistic, my rights, my rights, but uh, coming in with like a Bollywood. I, I thought you were going to go there. So oh. <laughs> maybe just curious to hear your thoughts. Is that even a thing anymore? The, the kind of the Bollywood expectations? Uh, you know, yes and no. I do think I mean, yes, it's always there to some degree, right? I, I and, think, and, and Sabia, I, I think you, I think you described it beautifully when you mentioned the idea of the soulmate kind of mythology, right? This yes. the soulmate myth, and, yes. and I mean, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood, I mean, it, there's enough of that sort of mm-hmm. um, that gets perpetrated, that, that gets perpetuated. Excuse me, where you know it's like you're going to find the love of your life, you're going to find you know the perfect soulmate, and that person, he or she, is the white, you know, is the knight in charming sh- shining armor or is the princess in the tower and, and, you know, you're going to ride off into the sunset and live happily ever after. I mean, I think that's, that's just a general trope that we need to, I mean, I get where that can cause problems in people, but uh, you know, we just need to get over that all of these sort of idyllic kind of images that were fed. Well, that's, you know, that's such a good word. You just said, right. Images. Okay. Our entire yeah. world exists oh, around yeah. image right now. Right. Everything is, what did you Insta, you know, post that day? What did your Instagram look like that day? So the idea that you just said, Omar, about this Bollywood idea. Yeah. It's a problem because we have to keep up with the Joneses, right? Like we got to keep up with all of my friends who married their best friend and they have the best marriage ever. And they had the most, you know, fantabulous looking wedding possible. And they, that, that guy rode in on a horse and this guy, you know, there's this, you know, constant, you know, we have to keep, you know, we, we keep up this, these appearances on all of our news, uh, social media feeds. And so I think with this generation, it's even more troubling and more like sort of catastrophic, right? Because their emotional maturity was not there and they had access to the world and the world had access to them. Okay. And we didn't have that when we were growing up, right? We, so you know, true. there was some hard knocks, right? There was, there was some, you know, to get to a guy, you had to call my home phone and my dad might answer, you know what I mean? <laughs> like to get no, to was, a, you know, like. I always tell my kids, I always tell that. my kids this. That's right. I always tell my ch- children this because they have a 24 seven peer group or, I, or excuse me, they have access to a 24 seven peer group, which we didn't have. And that that's number one. Number two, um, like for example, I mean, like, again, just you know, purely anecdotally, but, but I mean, just, I think it's relevant because I'm talking to Sadia. I mean, like my daughter, it, her best friend, Sadia is your niece who lives in a different time zone in a different city in Houston. And here, my daughter is in California and they are BFFs. Okay. Oh, that, yeah. oh, their yeah. entire relationship is, you know, remote. <laughs> is, is, yeah. is Isn't that incredible? When you it's incredible. It? But that's okay. so, but, but she has 24 seven access to her peer. And number two, there's no gatekeeper. Like you, like you just mentioned it, I remember even after I was engaged, I remember dreading that phone call, <laughs> calling my fiance at the time, now my wife, and having to answer, you know, having my mother-in-law or to be mother-in-law or to be father-in-law answer because I knew Absolutely. I'd have to at least put in a five-minute conversation and have that awkward, um, can I talk to us for, you know, can I talk to my wife? Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so- see, so that <laughs> access we're talking about, it's it's such a free-for-all at this point yeah. that, you know, when you're thinking about the idea of Bollywood, you know, it's so complicated. So one other issue I actually want to bring up, because this reminded me of it, I want to um, jump into it too. Right now, the other major issue is the idea of choice. We have an unending set of choices in our lives. Okay. How many times has someone said, Oh, I'm going to, you know, catch something on Netflix tonight. 
and found themselves scrolling for so long, an hour has passed, okay? Because we have endless amount of choice. We have endless amounts of choices in music and how we can access what we want. We have endless amount of choices in content, right? Just straight content, be it YouTube, be it Netflix, be it Hulu. Think about all, I can't even name off all the streaming services at this point because there's so many now, right? And so when you think about the con- concept of choice, it's 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 really messing with marriages right now. The infidelity because of that um because well one the, not just the infidelity the the um not committed the non-committals there's so many non-committed people like they're like oh should i is this guy this girl good enough is this guy good enough or should i have three or four in my back pocket so as they're on these dating apps and these muslim apps they're talking to like seven people at a time and even if they're very serious with one they're still talking to like four others and it's like well i can't you know, what if I miss out on something better? What if I, it's simply, it's almost as silly and similar as to why don't we just, when you are searching for a movie to watch, you don't just pick one and start, right? It's almost as silly as that. You're like, what if I come across a better one that I feel like, you know, watching today or will suit my mood better today? And, and, and but it also choice, tries, you know, that is a, yeah, that's a little commitment. crazy. No, that's it, an it amazing, also, that's an amazing point, Sadia. Sorry, Omar, I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, I, yeah, go for that it. is such a critical point. Because and and I and I tell my children this again. You're reminding me of so many conversations I'm having with my kids. But it's like you know I I tell them about this idea of the conundrum of choice, where too much choice and endless choices are a big problem, and it, it leads to not only like you mentioned, uh, you know, infidelity on one extreme, but just you know, non-committal. Like you can you know you feel like you don't have to commit because again, there's so many choices out there. And uh, that's an excellent point. No, that's I think I, I, that, that cannot be understated. Um, sorry, Omar. Yeah. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no worries. I, yeah, I, I agree hundred percent. And in fact, uh, just just doubling down on the on not just the non-committal pre-marriage piece of it, but what think about the 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 impact on marriages, right? Because it oh, ties no, back absolutely. to what you were saying about so like uh, what uh, what I, I think Sadia was saying about social media and how. Um, oh no, you were saying also the 24 seven access, right? Think about, um, the, the, the kind of the second guessing that could happen, um, by going to your social media feed, right? You see not just people having better vacations, but you actually see people, uh, who maybe cause you to question your, what you have, right. In general on that. And, and I think, uh, Saudi referred to even infidelity, right. Yeah. And, you know, something to bear in mind, I think in general, like, and, and just as a philosophical note is when we're talking about this idea of media and media in general, social media, certainly, and specifically is the, the whole concept of media comes from mediated, right? I mean, we are provide, we are fed mediated images. That is to say, you know, what you're seeing on a person's Instagram uh, or what you're seeing a feed or what you're seeing on your Facebook feed of other couples, other families is purely mediated content, right? I mean, they're not, they're not showing you warts and all you're seeing. Absolutely. Like you said, Omar, highlight reel. You're seeing, that's right. You're Thank seeing, you. Sports, Thank you. You're seeing their sports center clip. Like, that's <laughs> <what> you're <seeing. laughs> you and, you and Omar with the sports analogies. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> Hey, we're, we're it's uh, it's it's Houston Houston nineteen nineties uh, growing up. You can't you can't help yourself. Can't, can't not be a sports. <laughs> yeah. No, but really, you know, and, and, and when you when you see that when you um uh are exactly like you you understand that this is mediated content. You have to remind yourself that this is not this is the reality they want you to think you have, whether it be your full reality or moment, you know, like just a moment. You have to Mm -hmm. always remember Instagram, all these different things. They're a moment in time. It captured that moment. Now it's almost like if you've ever had to try to get your kids to look at the camera and smile at the same time, you know, when they were younger, it's like that, right? Weren't you just screaming at them two minutes ago to like get themselves together? Yet what did you capture? You captured a smile. And then weren't you yelling at them two minutes after because you're like, how long did that take? Why can't y'all just listen? You know, it's the same thing as adults, right? Same thing as families. I mean, this is what this looks like, right? You don't know. You caught that one moment in time. You don't know what happened before. You have no idea what happened after. And, And it's, you know, we have to keep reminding ourselves of that so that we're not deluded when we see our, when we're just, you know, scrolling through our feeds. And that's what I worry about the upcoming generation is that this is all they know, right? Scrolling through feeds is something I did in my 20s, right? Like not, uh, I don't say the late twenties. Actually, you know, really, really thirties. Actually, and so, I mean, these kids have been doing this since they were like eleven, right? So uh, they don't know any other world. 
So that's my, you know, kind of future concerns is like, man, they, all they know is to sort of compare the idea of choice, the idea of non, you know, it's okay to not commit because there's always someone else, you know, these are the things, as you said, Omer, like in marriage, they can be very tricky and they have caused a lot of problems. So before we get into, um, I mean, and we have a lot, and I, and I want to be mindful of your time as well, Sadia. So, um, you know, in, in that spirit, uh, before we leave this topic and get into, I think, like dissolution of marriage and, and where marriages can, you know, some of the problems that creep in and, and how we deal with that. Um, you know, I, I, I'd love, I mean, I, I touched on this idea of nuclear families and, and that whole, that whole kind of structure, how it's fundamentally changed. Um, you know, it has changed in the sense that, you know, prior generations, even our parents' generations typically lived in interge- intergenerational households. We no longer have that as 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 uh, as pervasive. It's certainly there, but it's not as pervasive. But if you could talk to um, talk to this idea of kind of settling setting and establishing boundaries as it relates to the in laws, right? I mean, you know, talking about tradition. I mean, the prophet, you know. He literally the hadith says like the in law is death, right? I mean, so it's like it's like understanding that in laws can cause problems, and so how do you establish boundaries with your own family family members as they are often want to do, which is opine on your marriage, opine on your relationship, opine on when you should have kids, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, you know, in laws are such a big deal. Still, it doesn't matter if you're talking second generation, third generation. You know, um, especially always culturally, but really just everybody. Honestly, um, there's you know there is uh, a lot of issues that that are still very much there, and I think a lot of it comes down to you know there's many times I'll look at the men in a in a couple session and I'll say, listen, this is going to be a lot on you. You have a lot to work with here in terms of you're talking about that traditional, almost like if we're talking Bollywood, sort of that that, you know, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law dynamic, right? Um, and, and feeling like the, the the husband is typically caught in the middle, you know? And, and it is something that's very tricky. It's something that, you know, he has to be very balanced about. Now, of course, it goes both ways. And between the wives, you know, family members, of course, there also needs to be boundaries and everything. I think that in Desi culture, this tends to fall a little bit more on the, the, the husband's side, but definitely not always. There are always um, plenty of, of other exceptions and whatnot. But I think in general, the idea of boundaries has to be with whoever is the blood family member and whoever is the, um, you know, um, that side, that's the person that sets the boundaries. That's the person that sets the tone and says, look, you know, this is where I I hear you. I want to, I I'm, I'm respectfully speaking to you. I'm, I'm understanding exactly what you're saying, but we as a couple have to make our own decisions. Like we have to do what's best for our family. And it's a very hard, I mean, this is just a difficult conversation to ever have. It's probably one that it's almost like, I'd say you win some, you lose some, (laughs) you know, um, you, you just, you win some, you lose some, you know, you, you try, uh, you, you set those boundaries as much as you can, because, you know, I I think it's a very strange dynamic. And I, I, and it is, I would say a little worse sort of in the immigrant culture of the idea of, instead of maybe like general American um, society, the, the, the idea of control, you know, there is a strange set of control and a power dynamic that always tends to be there within the in-laws, you know, where um, uh, who are who is being uh, more listened to, who is being more paid attention to, who has more power simply, right? Um, it, you know, these type of things, they cause so many problems in the marriage. You know, do you know how many clients I have had who have been married for quite a while that really, when we start to get into the therapy, one of the biggest things we're talking about is family squabbles during the wedding. Like these are people with like a kid, two kids and whatever, like they've been married for years. And what are we coming down to the wedding, right? Just the fact that, Oh, that side of the family, they didn't pick us up from the airport. Oh, did you know that side of the family? They served us old food. Like, I mean, I'm just like, you are seven years into your marriage. What kind of conversation are we having right now? Right? So there is this, you know, weird sense of control. There's an entitlement there that needs to be put into check. Um, you know, there's some things that really the couple has to talk about beforehand. You know, again, those primary and really important conversations as to how is this going to get negotiated? And my advice is typically that the communication happen 
by the blood relative, right? Whether it be the husband's family, the wife's family, like you be the one that sets the boundaries, sets the tone, create what within that family, like let them know how this is going to work. Yeah, because I think, and I think we're going to see this happen more and more, uh, meaning in terms of how this is going to impact marriages, because, you know, the baby boomer generation, they're retiring or they're past retirement now. And although they came, they immigrated to the United States, in many cases, they left behind their own families, the expectations they certainly have are that my son or my daughter, I'm going to, I'm going to live with them and I'm going to, or they're, or they're going to provide me a space within their house, or they're going to move in to my house. And I think, I mean, I, I can certainly sit, you know, speak anecdotally, not personally, but yet, but, but, but certainly just among my friends and people I know where this is a, these are real serious conversations that, you know, you should have seen coming 10 years ago, but now you're facing as an immediate consequence of the fact that, our parents are getting old. That that baby boomer generation is getting old. They're retiring or they're past retirement, and so how do you you know how do you navigate that new or potentially new family dynamic that's going to that's going to take hold? Yeah, I think it's uh, what you said. It's it's like you've got to have these conversations. You've got to talk about what's so. Well, here's what's interesting, and I've seen this happen a lot, and it's tricky. It's I mean, there's real no. Uh, you know, perfect way about this, but basically, so people will talk about this before marriage and maybe the, the husband says, Hey, listen, um, I'm, I'm, you know, the only son and there's really only one sister, but she lives far away. And at some point, if my parents need it, I, you know, they may live with us. Are you okay with that? At the That's time, right. Typically, the girl will say, you know, yeah, that makes sense if there's health issues. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, that that's understandable. Okay. Fast forward quite a bit. Uh, that, that dynamic, they don't have a good relationship, say, right. The, the, right. the husband's family and the daughter. law Yeah. And then, you know, five years in the husband's like, yay, it's time to move in. Right. Or, you know, it's time, it's that time. And that pressure starts to happen and all of that. And then what do they say? Hey, we talked about this. You said you agreed. You said it would be okay. Right. But I was, I was the, agreeing in the abstract, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I was agreeing yeah. and not in reality. I was agreeing in my rose colored glasses and, you know, you didn't, uh, didn't notice the red flags that that family has some quirks about them, you know, and stuff. And so there has to be some more honest conversations that say, look, you know what, in theory, I think that's a perfectly understandable, but can we wait to see how this relationship develops? Can we see, can we form a proper healthy relationship so that I would even want to do that, right? So that I would want to take care of them and be, you know, have them with us. And so it, that's kind of the tricky piece I've come across a lot lately is that people will mm -hmm. agree to one thing before the marriage. And when it's time to execute, it's like, oh God, no, you know, I, 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 what I, this is not what I thought. This isn't what I signed up for. And so it's kind of like saying, Hey, how do we navigate this relationship the whole time? Not when major decisions have to be made, right? So it's kind of like not ignoring that relationship because a lot has to be done with that one. Yeah. Um, no, excellent point. And, and I think we've kind of um, we've touched on it, but we haven't really dived, you know, d dived into it. But you know, if we're talking about marriages that fall apart, you know, so I guess. Primarily, my or my initial question to you would be like, what are those red flags? Well, I mean, I think we've already kind of talked about the red flags, but but or the yellow flags, perhaps even. But I guess what, when 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 a couple realizes that divorce or separation is better than staying together, um, you know, what is the advice that you give for those kind of couples? You know, that's a, such a tough one um, Obviously, because I'll have, right. right. Because I'll have a lot of couples that'll come in and be like, well, what do you think we should do? <laughs> it's like, you know, it's probably not mutual. It's probably usually one or the other. There's no way they can always be on the same page all the time. Right. It's probably a, one couple, one person from the couple driving and for pushing for it. Correct. Is that, I'm just guessing, is that, is that a fair statement or no? Yeah. I mean, it, typically, sure. There's usually one person, um, which is, by the way, not ideal. Um, you know, when, when someone comes into therapy dragging, and, you know, kicking and screaming, it's not, it's not going to be great. Um, but it's still okay. We can, you know, potentially work with that. But it's, I think the idea that when a couple is, you know, well-intentioned, wants to come in, wants to kind of do something, um, you know, I think 
when they ask me that question, I say, listen, you know, this is my usual spiel. I have no skin in this game. Okay. My, like what happens to you all? Yes. I care about you as people, but you know, the consequences of this decision, you will have to live out, right? You will have to play out the rest of what happens, right? That one decision impacts things for a very, very long time. And so you really, you know, part of my job is to play out both of those roads, right? Let's put all the possibilities out here. What would it look like for you if you had to, you know, to, to separate? What what does life look like? Where, you know, and, and so the way I answer that question, typically, if they have children, um, it's a pretty simple answer where I say, listen, if the your marriage is in a, a such a toxic or such a difficult place or a maybe cold, you know, not bitter place that it's negatively impacting your children, divorce needs to be on the table. Like you need to start talking about it or at least separation or at least some, like something needs to be on the table as to how, you know, because what you're doing is, like I said, those kids that I see in their twenties, in their own marriages, nine times out of 10, their parents' marriage was terrible. Okay. And they didn't realize how terrible until they were in their own marriages, making their own mistakes. Right. They, they, and, and if you could, you know, Sadia, sorry. And, and I don't know if this is true because I'm no expert, but you are, which is like, is it like, because often the, the, uh, you know, what you hear growing up or, or the war, I guess, I don't want to call it a myth, but the kind of, I guess, conventional wisdom being, well, you know, divorced couples or, or, or children who come from divorced families often end up in divorce themselves. Is that true? Or is it more where, you know, children who come from broken, you know, uh, marriages or broken uh, uh, and dysfunctional families are the ones who themselves become broken and dysfunctional. Yeah, I mean, it's it's both, to be very honest, right? I don't necessarily buy into the idea of the um, broken home situation, like, oh, that, you know, that that means that their um, success in marriage is not going to be good. It, it, it really just doesn't work that way, not so directly in terms of causality. And you're also not going to get that. But but there is a lot more on the other side that we don't talk about, right? That you, you stayed in a, a, you know, what looks like an intact home. Uh, but the model of marriage you saw was so toxic and so unhealthy that that does end up being the patterns you end up repeating. And so that actually does happen quite often, you know, and why I said early on, you get to know that family, get to know the model of marriage that they saw, get to know what they thought was healthy and unhealthy and the things they appreciated about their parents' marriage and the things they didn't, because these things do have your, they just have an effect, right? Um, and so it's it's a really important point to make. You know, when you were mentioning conventional wisdom, what I thought you were going, what I thought next was going to come out of your mouth was stay together for the kids, right? Oh, like right. stay, you know, you should stay together for the kids' sake, right? I really have a trouble with that statement because you may have done them a much worse disservice by yeah. thinking that this is actually what a normal marriage is. Right. That's right. And then, and then then that was my point when I was talking about like broken households or broken marriages where, you know, that's in fact more detrimental to the child than, uh, you know, just the fact that their parents ended up divorcing. Right. Right. So especially I mean, if they did it somewhat amicably, somewhat, you know, there you go. if you now there you if go. you have a horrendous dragging divorce with custody battles and this and that. Yeah, then sure. that's going to leave right. your kid in some some bad shape, right? But sure. if you have an overall, you know, okay-ish and, you know, and, and they're always a bit contentious, I'll say, uh, to some degree, a very few have gone, you know, perfectly amicably. Because um, as Omar said, it's usually one that wanted out a little more than the other, typically. Um, and so, yeah, they can get pretty contentious. Now, if you're talking about a regular kind of slightly contentious, but overall, okay. Yes, I agree with what you said. You know, it, it is much worse to see. And, you know, you've seen that growing up, maybe you get married at 23, 24, whatever. So for 23, 24 years, this is what you think is normal. Mm -hmm. Right? As a wife, if you're the girl or as a husband, if you're the man. And so, you know, I, I don't know if what you're going to get out of there is, is healthy, anything healthy. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Um, and I guess, I mean, to, you know, the elephant in the room, as it were, or kind of the obvious red flags, you know, being things like abuse, um, whether it's, you know, obviously physical abuse, verbal abuse, spiritual abuse, all the things that you mentioned, Sadia, which are, I think are very, very important and critical, but also, you know, one spouse struggling with substance abuse issues. I mean, these are the, or, and certainly infidelity. I mean, these are the, the, the big red flags, but what do you, Again, there. So, yeah, you know that's even actually a really great question. It's, it's flags, very, very difficult when you're. How when do you counter couples, or in, probably in more cases has, than not, 
had you know this oppression and this kind of stuff you, potentially done to who you, the, you know, uh, I asked them again, you know, the what do you think? Of abuse. Uh, do you think Allah um, then, wanted this for you? Wants this? Yeah, for you? like is this how do you, you advise them? I mean, you know, no, he I imagine it's different for each, you each a loving, compassionate, instance, and merciful God. Would he I guess want in general, you to be, maybe kind of talk you know, to that miserable, like, you know, yeah, life, so, right? Not when, thriving, when, but just when should a person know that you know this enough? You know what I mean? Allah wanted for you, okay? Then you know, then okay. But you know, more often than not, somebody in that type of situation, they obviously can't answer that way, right? They 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 say no, you know, of course not. I mean, I I a lot of people will say, you know, I just feel like I'm withering away. And I'll say this is, you know, frankly, majority women that will talk, you know, that that have this type of um, reaction yeah. or, or and because and, and, and you know why? Because divorce is so much dif- more difficult on the women in our culture. Um, you know, culturally speaking, divorce, it just has such a significant impact, um, you know, very sadly to say, um, in terms of, you know, the remarriage rate and whatnot, it's, 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 you know, something so archaic about our culture that we really need to, to, to improve as we go forward, because, you know, frankly, divorce is, you know, the divorce rate is in the Muslim community, it's at about 30, 35%. So you're talking about one in three Muslim couples are divorcing. So this is no, you know, this isn't a minor issue anymore. We're going that's to right. know a lot more divorced people as time yeah. passes. Because I mean, people often talk about the stigma of divorce, but I think if you know, I, I think that's that's sugarcoating the reality of the fact that what we're really talking about is the stigmatized wife, right? Or the or the like the stigmatized divorcee wife, because you know, more often than not, and especially in our culture, because you know, that particular position is so much more stigmatized than the. The, like the divorcee uh, husband or, or the male um, with, without children. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, the the thing when you said, you know, what do you tell them in terms of when is that breaking point? You know, you just say yeah. like, is the instance that you have, you know, is one, especially if there's children involved. So you bring up the idea of, you know, they're going to grow up with some issues, right. And some, some, some problems too, you know, how much is this negatively affecting them, right? Maybe you fight a lot. Maybe there's a lot of verbal abuse in the house. Maybe there's physical abuse. Maybe there's uh, threats and intimidation, whether, whether you know, acted out upon or not. Anger, lots of anger management issues in our culture, rage, right? You know, is that a healthy environment for your kid? How much worse is it for them to be in two separate yet peaceful households? Right. That's the kind of th- the conversation you have to start to have to say, you know, how bad is it really? Right. And, you know, when you come from the Islamic perspective, um, you know, the fact that there is a surah called Surah Talaq, the fact that Talaq is talked about so much in the Quran that you're just like, could it be something so bad? <laughs> you know, can it be something so terrible that Allah felt the need to describe it and tell you how to do it so clearly? you know, and, and yeah. to leave them with kindness and all of these different things. Yet somehow we think it's smart to be contentious about it and fight it to the last straw. And I mean, I get it. You know, we want our, our families to remain intact. As I said earlier, you know, don't get me wrong. That road is not much easier. There is a whole lot, um, you know, just so many consequences long-term when you make that decision. However, you know, again, is it enough? Is it, is it de- so detrimental that your current existence is any better? And, and I guess a question related to that as, as we're kind of getting to, close to the end here is, do you think more people are making mistakes to stay together or more people are making the mistake of divorcing prematurely? That's a great question. Yeah. Thank you for asking that, Omar. Yeah. So it's a, you know, I, I find this to be very strange. There's this whole idea right now that like, oh, everybody just quits on marriage so easily <laughs> yeah, no so anymore. Everybody just wants out now. I frankly, I don't see that at all. Like, I don't know what people are talking about. I think people still understand divorce is tough. I have people that have been married, you know, a year and a half or two years. And and frankly, in my head, I'm saying, get out. (laughs) You know, I don't want to see you in 10 years with your three beautiful kids who are going to have a much harder time with this. You know, like if you're both single and you've realized, oh man, we made a mistake. Like we are massively different personalities, like weird. And, And again, there's no extremes in this, right? work, you know, work on it, go to counseling, get the help you can get. But if you come to that conclusion early on, I think it is fantastic to get out. Okay. Because you did not bring more complicated issues into it, i.e. children, you know, uh, finances, lots of other things. Right. So, 
I, I feel like there's no, I don't get this. Uh, yes, there's a whole lot of talk out there of like, I'm not putting up with that. I'm not dealing with this. There's a whole big talk and a big game out there um, that this generation likes to say. But I don't think that they are rushing to divorce. I think these, and, and, and you know what's so interesting? Let me tell you, just a few days ago, um, I, I consult with an imam in Houston about just different, um, we kind of have a nice working relationship in terms of, you know, spiritual issues. I kind of punt off to him, you know, you know marriage, whatever issues he'll punt off to me and it's kind of a nice working relationship um in that sense and i was mentioning to him that alhamdulillah in the last month i've had like i don't know six seven premarital couples uh reach out and this is every range you can imagine they're like in their late teens early 20s early 30s some are on their second third marriages you know with blended families i mean it's been really great and as i said that to him the first thing he said he said man alhamdulillah i'm so happy to hear that he goes but you know what else i hear constantly the breaking of marriage is 15 plus years out Right. And so is it a matter of people didn't try hard enough? You're going to tell somebody that was married 16 years. You didn't try hard enough. You know, I think that's kind of a ridiculous thing to say. Like, of course they tried. Why would you think they were there that long? You know? So, Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, I don't, I don't see the, the numbers that, that, that makes sense to say that, that people quit too soon. Um, Maybe there's a vibe out there, an idea, this ultra, you know, independent sort of way of being right now, maybe, but I don't see it play out in the actual numbers and in reality. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really interesting. Um, so at, like I said, we're really appreciate your time. Uh, we spent almost, almost two hours with us and it's, it's been, you know, we've, we've touched on a lot of pretty, pretty intense topics like divorce and, and challenging marriages. What, what, what's one thing that's a sign of uh, hopeful, a sign of hope or positive thing you're seeing that maybe we can, uh, you know, as we, as we get close to the end, we can, we can leave our, our, our listeners with something, something positive you're seeing as a trend. Um, yeah, as I had started at the beginning that, you know, mental health in general, marriage and family therapy as a concept, um, you know, it's it's really gaining a lot more traction now. There's, um, I, I mentioned in my example a minute ago, there's imams and, and religious leaders that are more on board with this. There are training programs out there for imams to, you know, have sort of that mental health first aid, you know, knowing how to be that front line of people's problems and issues and being, you know, learning the validation and certain skills that you need to have have as opposed to being like, go home, be patient, you know, and that's, that's the end of that. Um, you know, they're learning a lot more. I, I will say there's a lot more, you know, um, research being done. I see a lot more surveys and lots of great data coming out from the American Muslim community as to how can we start addressing these things better. So, I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful in that sense that, uh, again, you know, the fact that I just said, you know, several couples reached out to do premarital counseling and all over the board, you know, and excited about it. You know, that this is this is important. They want to invest in this. You know, what was really neat is one of them was what was a gift like for the wedding. This was somebody's gift to them that I will pay for your premarital counseling sessions. Right. And I'm like, wow, what a what a tremendous uh, investment in these people's lives. You know, that you're instead of, you know, you can get everyone a nice blender or whatever, you know, um, a nice set or give them the same <laughs> fifty hundred dollars that you give. Right. Your usual hundred dollar gift or whatever. But, you know, giving them this and you're setting them up for such a great, you know, um, tools and strategies to, you know, go to use in their marriage essentially. And it's really one of the, you know, greatest things I would heard and seen in terms of a yeah. wedding gift. So there's things like that, that I, I mean, I'm very hopeful about, you know, again, our communities come a long way. We still have a long way to go. Um, I do see a lot more remarriages. I do see a lot more. Um, so it's happening. It's, it's a slow go. Um, and some days I'm hit with, you know, something so, foreign and you know sort of archaic and outdated that it hurts uh, you know but overall i think that the you know there's been some more traction going forward and it's, it definitely makes me hopeful alhamdulillah. no alhamdulillah and, and I, I really want to end on that hopeful note and and it, and it gives me hope just hearing you say that because i mean you really being on the front lines uh in terms of seeing these challenges that we've discussed um it's refreshing because i mean uh, you know, as far as like, it's just refreshing to hear that we're not still, um, you know, uh, negotiating these relationships and, and having these conversations within that old kind of prism of either this great deal of stigma that's associated with mental health or seeking counseling in general, 
or the um, often kind of spiritually bypassing the issue by, you know, well, you're not praying hard enough or you're not, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with your with regards to your relationship with God. As opposed to, you know, actually, you know, hey, talk to an expert, go to a counselor and, and, and talk to, you know, talk through your feelings. There's nothing wrong with you as a Muslim because you're having these challenges. Um, so that's really, really refreshing, Sadia. And I want I want to leave our listeners on that refreshing note. Um, I guess um, as a final kind of point, um, you talked about your um, your own um I guess the work that you're doing and the project that you have, I mean, maybe if you could maybe talk a little bit more about it, uh, where can people find you? Where can people reach out, see the work that you're doing? I know you, you, you also were doing some video content as well. Yeah. Um, thanks for reminding me. So um, right now I'm, I'm still in the process of kind of putting a lot more things together. So right now there's a Facebook page of Muslim Bliss. Feel free to go there, like the page. I do try to put some videos out and some content, some just gentle reminders and different things for marriages to kind of um, ponder and reflect on some parenting things, things like that. Um, I also have a website. It's in, in process right now. I'll put it out there because inshallah, I do plan to have a little bit more content on there. Um, it is also Muslim Bliss, but it's muslim-bliss.com um, and so that will have inshallah the, the plan is to have um, premarital training online fully where it would be a section a set of like maybe six different uh, series where you know one is about communication one is about you know triggers or you know things i mean there's the whole thing right of problem solving and whatnot so several different areas to cover um and it'll come with you know handouts and things to to work on prior and again this is very helpful because a lot of times in our community in particular people marry from out of state people marry from you know my cousins relatives friends you know son daughter from some other city or state so that can be helpful they can do it online they don't have to be local. Um, so there's a couple of things like that. I've done some divorce uh, recovery groups online. I've t- tailored it to women right now, but I've realized there's actually a very strong need for men to have um, some divorce recovery as well. So some different projects like that, that's kind of what, um, and of course, marital enrichment in general, um, inshallah is always the goal. So for me, it's a matter of all the different relationship phases that a marriage can go through, trying to develop some content around all of those different phases from like a Muslim lens, having some Islamic framework around them. Uh, fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much, Sadia, for, uh, I mean, we took two plus hours of your time. So thank you for being so generous with your time. And, uh, you know, it was just great connecting with you in general, but These are uh, big issues, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got too through hard. a lot. Yeah. Oh, we got through a lot. No, we, 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 we covered a lot. I think, um, your insight was just invaluable. And, um, I mean, you, you, you said some very flattering things at the outset about me. And I'll say that, I mean, if any of that is true about what you said about me, I mean, I couldn't be prouder, uh, prouder of the, of the person you've become. And so, um, I'm just so glad and honored to even have known you so, or, or know you in general. So I, I just want to thank you for all the work that you're doing and continue to do. Uh, and we couldn't be prouder. So, um, thank you as always, uh, Omar, I don't know if you have any final thoughts. If you don't, um, yeah, well, uh, just uh, of, of course, you guys, you guys definitely, uh, you, you definitely said it, but uh, just extending my thanks for, for the time. Uh, two hours is a lot to, to commit on a, on a Saturday night. Um, and it was a really important discussion. Uh, I think it's going to help people, not just in one phase, but all the phases, right? Whether they're they're single and looking or they're in a marriage or they're, they're having problems, I think. I think some, we talked about things that could potentially help all those groups of people. So we appreciate it. That's right. And um, so much. really, um, really happy to be here. And, you know, thank you again for always starting these interesting conversations and, and bringing these issues to the forefront. Really, um, it's just such a valuable service to the American Muslim community. So thank you, guys. No, thank you. And uh, thank you, as always, to our listeners. Uh, if you have any thoughts, feedback, questions, uh, send them our way. Diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can uh, engage us on Facebook, facebook.com slash Diffuse Congruence. Also on Twitter at Diffuse C. Uh, definitely check us out. Look forward to our next uh, episode. And thank you from us to you. And thank you, Sadia Jalali, for joining us. We'll see you on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. <laughs>